What is up, guys? Austin Nerd Show here, back again with another Monday Night Rewind podcast where we go back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars and cover Raw, because we're no longer doing Nitro now, from 1998. So this is the first episode where we will only cover Raw episodes from the corresponding week in 1998. So this week we're looking at February 2nd, 1998, and so as I mentioned, we will not be doing Nitro, so instead we're going to be hitting the fast forward button going into the future to the current days, where I'm going to bring in my brother and we're going to talk about the current stuff going on. So of course this past weekend we had the Royal Rumble, so we'll talk about news with that and any other stories and stuff, news going on in the current day. But first we're going to hit the rewind all the way back to 98, and we're covering Raw number 245 again from February 2nd, 1998, so it's Groundhog's Day. Um, um, and this got a 3.45 rating, so pretty much the same for what they're doing, you know, up a little maybe by a small amount. But this took place in Indianapolis, Indiana. So, of course, now, once again, this is my home state. It took place in Fort Wayne last week, and now this week it's in Indianapolis. So, again, my home state and the city I live in and stuff. So, it's even closer to home and all I can think about, especially with this episode, because to me, at least in my life, this is kind of a big episode or, like, important stuff goes on here and happens. And just to think, like, you know, I was a fan back then, and I always wanted to go to a wrestling show. And the thought that, you know, I was a fan at this time, and I always wanted to go to the show that I could have went, but our parents would never, ever take us. And I never went to my first wrestling show until I was in college and stuff. So I really wish I would have been here after seeing this. But we'll get into the show now. So it kicks off with what they're calling a DX special report. But of course you'll know this segment. This is where DX comes on and does the whole standards and practices type thing for TV stuff from like USA or whatever. Where they've been getting in trouble for doing certain things on Raw and everything. And so they're trying to, they're coming out saying, you know, making fun of the whole thing of being told they're not able, allowed to do this stuff anymore. So there's kind of also presenting it as a presidential like segment type thing because they have the presidential seal but it, on top it says DX and sort of stuff and then they with what they do later it kind of fits in with whole presidential thing so I don't know what's going on at this point if there's like election type things going on I don't know at this point 98 but yeah they're doing this and so it comes up with them standing in front of a podium and again they're in front of like a screen trying to look all presidential and stuff and Sean's talking about how standards and practices has drawn a line on them because DX is getting in trouble for anything they do on TV especially if it's gratuitous and so of course just saying you know these people are just shutting us down and so Triple H then gets on and says you know from the hours of 9 to 10 p.m. we will only use the words ass hell and damn and they will not use, and then it starts bleeping a whole bunch of words they say, and so they're bleep, so you can't hear what he's saying. But you could assume they're um, some bad words. And then it goes, and then from the hours of 10 p.m. to 11 p.m., we will only use as hell damn, and, and he says another word, and it gets beeped. So I assume since it's in the hours of 9 that it's a word wasn't included in that first list, and it's on the second list, that's a thing from the not to use from the first list, and so that's why it's bleep this time, I don't know, and then he's like, and then we will not use, and he starts going off on stuff, and then uh, one word he says, and Sean goes, are you bleeping kidding me, and like, you know, get bleeped and everything, and they just keep going, hey, shut your bleep mouth, and stuff like that, and they just keep going back and forth saying words, they get bleeped out and everything, so it's a whole big funny segment going on here. And then Sean gets back on and saying, and we're not allowed to make, or we have to make less references to our very large genitalia. So obviously from the whole cookout segment last week with the um, jumbo weenies and stuff like that, they probably got in trouble for. And then at the very end, Sean mentioned something and he says, but I just want to specify that I did not sleep with that intern. Of course, playing off the whole Bill Clinton reference thing with Monica Lewinsky and stuff like that. But he says, I did not sleep with that intern because I was up all night and stuff as he says it obviously making jokes of that whole thing and so again pulling in topical references there to the whole bill clinton stuff that was going on and then of course the whole banning of stuff that dx has done bad things on tv and so now wwf is getting in trouble for it through usa network and standards and practices and all that so then we have the actual show like opening video thing and we come back and DX is coming out to the ring and they're dressed up all patriotic so they have like I don't know how to like they look dressed kind of like Uncle Sam but they're wearing like blue coat type things that look old style and then they have red white and blue top hats and stuff again like how you picture Uncle Sam 
is how they what they were wearing and stuff and they come out and get in the ring and they're holding picket signs and then balloons start red white and blue balloons start falling from the ceiling and of course like as soon as the whole thing settles down and they start to do their whole promo and stuff you just hear balloons popping like crazy and so they're just being popped by people all over the arena and stuff going crazy but they come into the ring and like i said they're holding picket signs and they're all have stuff written on them in reference to Tyson and Austin. So again, Sean's continuing with what they did last week where he was saying, oh, let them fight. I'll be like the special guest referee and stuff. And so now they're holding signs like Pickett ad to advocate for the match to go on. And so they start kind of promo about how Tyson and Austin should face each other. And then they start a let them fight chant. So getting the whole arena to start chanting, let them fight, let them fight and stuff. And of course they're doing that. And then Stone Cold's music hits and Stone Cold comes down to the ring and he gets in the ring and he's just up in Sean's face like kind of staring at him. And then he mentions, he's like, I'm glad to see you support the match against Tyson. But the fact is that I won the Royal Rumble, which means your ass belongs to Stone Cold and stuff. So again, he's, you know, lying like, yeah, the match with Tyson would be nice, but I won the match. So I want a shot at the championship and you have the championship. So you're going to give it to me. And he continues on by saying, you know, I don't care what you say or what you do, that that bell is coming to Stone Cold Steve Austin, whether you like it or not. And of course, then that makes Sean mad. So they start just getting in each other's face more, just like, like staring each other down. And Sean's kind of like backing Stone Cold up as in Stone Cold's like just starting to leave the ring and stuff. And Sean like keeps walking towards him and stuff. And they just kind of keep facing each other down and DX backing Sean up and stuff until Stone Cold leaves the ring. So then we come back and we get our next match or the beginning of our next match, which is going to be a friendly hardcore match between Chainsaw Charlie and Cactus Jack. And so, of course, Chainsaw comes out or down to the ring and he's pushing out like a, I don't know how to describe it. It's like a trash can, but it's a, or like a dumpster type thing, but it's small and it's on wheels. Like you see like janitors at like big places pushing them around because they can collect multiple like trash cans of trash and put them in this big bin and push it around to take it to an actual dumpster and stuff but he's pushing that out and of course it's full of weapons of actual trash cans and all sorts of different weapons like that you would chairs and stuff that you would use and so he pushes that out to the ring and is in the ring of course doing the stuff with the chainsaw well then it throws to an interview that jr conducted with mick foley and terry funk about why they're having this match tonight against each other and they're just talking about you know how they're old friends and mick is or Terry Funk is Mick Foley's like idol or um, hero or whatever you want to call it person he looks up to and so that they just want to have a fun match together and show people what hardcore really is and Terry's like you know I don't know how many matches I'll have left especially hardcore ones and I want to make sure I have one with this guy and stuff like that and so they're just kind of building each other up yet having a friendly competition thing going on here at the same time and so goes back to the ring and on you hear like over the system whatever like on a microphone you hear Cactus Jack and he's saying, you know, Terry, that's not a trash can. This is a trash can. And then it goes up to the entrance ramp and he comes, uh, Cactus comes pushing out an actual like dumpster like you find out behind buildings and stuff. He comes pushing one of them up into like through the curtains and stuff onto the top of the ramp or the stage or whatever. And so they start their hardcore match and, and so it's just pretty much just fighting all with weapons and stuff. And so I think they start chainsaw comes up to the top of the ramp and they just start fighting with each other and stuff and chains mick foley goes to do something but chainsaw ends up putting a roll up on cactus and because it's a roll up you know they're in like the ball shape well they just start rolling down the ramp to the bottom and stuff which is i thought was funny and they just get up in the ring and start fighting with each other and they have a lot of or they have trash cans in the ring and they just keep doing a lot of headshots on each other with the trash can like I think it's Mick keeps hitting Terry Funk with a bunch of trash cans and then Mick just stops and hands Terry the trash can and is just like standing there going like come on hit me hit me and stuff and so Chainsaw um, eventually hits him in the head and stuff and so they just keep fighting along and so they start fighting back up the ramp and Chainsaw grabs a table and he sets it up on the ramp next to the dumpster and Terry throws McFoley on it or Cactus and Chainsaw starts to go for a pile driver on it but Cactus Jack reverses which fly flips Chainsaw into the dumpster. And so Cactus goes over and grabs a ladder and he sets it up next or like to leaning or whatever up against the tight hole tight drawn to their big video wall thing. And he sets it up and climbs up to the ladder onto the Titan Tron. And then he's just kind of skirting along on their, like, like I said, their outline thing of the Titan Tron. 
and he jumps off doing the elbow drop onto chainsaw in the dumpster and so they're inside of that was well, they're inside you know rustling around and stuff the new age outlaws end up coming through the curtain and they like are like sneaking up on the dumpster and stuff they're trying to be quiet and stuff and they go up and they shut the lids down on the dumpster and then take rope and stuff and tie the lids down so that uh, cactus and chainsaw aren't able to escape and then the outlaws you know just start looking around and stuff and they end up starting to push the dumpster and they push it off the stage to the ground below which was they kept saying about a 10 foot drop I don't know if that's real or not but you never know but so they push the dumpster off the stage like I said 10 feet and stuff with cactus and chainsaw inside of it and so this becomes a whole big thing and that's why I'm saying this episode first because of the DX thing and two because of this whole match thing is a big part of my childhood because the Wrestlemania that sticks in my mind and everything was Wrestlemania 14 which had the dumpster match and this was the whole setup for it and so for me at least in my life this is a pretty big segment and everything and so me is that happen a bunch of officials and a bunch of wrestlers end up coming out and they're trying to get the dumpster lids open to help the guys out and they eventually get it open and you can just see the guys inside all wrecked and stuff which I mean there was a lot of crap inside so I assume no one actually got hurt or anything and um like I think on I think I heard on something that mentioned it or whatever they talked about this and saying you know that they had a bunch of extra crap and padding in there to cover it up so the guys didn't get hurt as much but you know they still felt something but they get it open and you see the guys just laying there and the camera goes over and it's showing both of them just lying in the dumpster like knocked down stuff and one of them's their hands just shaking really bad and stuff and so throughout this whole time we they keep going to like commercials or whatever and stuff and coming back and we get a part where Vince is talking with the outlaws like he has more side and they're saying you know we didn't mean it for it to happen like that I didn't think that was going to happen and all sorts of stuff of course just trying to like cover themselves up and you know say they didn't mean to do this and stuff even though they did it and so eventually an ambulance comes showing up and they start loading the guys or onto like uh, boards and stuff to get them into the ambulance and everything and at this point Sonny comes over and she's just holding on to Terry's hand and she just keeps like saying Terry and stuff and she's crying she has tears running down her face and everything so she's playing this whole thing up and stuff and eventually um it go camera pans over and flash funk is being held back by officials because he's trying to um get to the new age outlaws like he's pushing real hard trying to get to him and then a few seconds later the headbangers start fighting with the outlaws and the outlaws clothes end up getting ripped and stuff and so i asked my brother about this i'm like i wonder if they told the guys this would happen because obviously wrestling's you know fake for the most part stuff is happening and predetermined all that sort of stuff and so you know i wonder if what they call smarten the guys up and so say everyone but the people that were involved if they knew what was going to happen and so if this was all just playing up so you know flash was just you know acting like he was mad and the headbangers were acting like they're mad or if they didn't know what's happening and thought you know the guys were actually hurt and they were acting like this because I would say if they were acting, these guys need to win like awards or something because the way they were acting and looks on their face looked like they were actually angry and pissed off and stuff. And then, you know, with Sonny crying like that, like she looked pretty convincing like she was crying. But she was, you know, I still don't know if it was real or not for her. But I want to know if that was real or not. Or if, like I said, if it they knew about it or they didn't. But either way, it was really good segment overall. And so, you know, they load them up into the ambulance stuff. And we go to commercial and come back. And the outlaws are in the back. And they're on the time drone or whatever. And JR's talking to him, And he asks him if it was worth the price or not to get over. And, of course, so they're bringing turns in terms in now like getting over and stuff like that into wrestling and they just say that you know they were doing what they had to do for the company and stuff and then all of a sudden sean and triple h come up and start confronting him and like yelling like what the hell were you thinking and stuff they're like everything is about raising the bar to get ratings he continues with saying you guys just did what you had to do and stuff and you did it so don't be so hard on yourself because you know you did it for ratings and you did it for what vince wants you know ratings and raising the bar and stuff so again they're trying to turn on that vince is you know the person behind this that he's the one why they did it like they acted bad because they're trying to get higher up and better in the company and they're just doing that because vince won't you know look at him or notice some and stuff and so by doing this they're you know trying to help themselves out even though they hurt people in the process 
So then we go to hour number two and we come back and so we get our, our next match. So there's not many matches on the show, but because of that whole thing, that took up, you know, pretty much a whole hour of the show. But um, we come back with the match of Billy Gunn coming out with Road Dog, who's taking on Owen Hart. And so as the match starts, as Owen's coming out to the ring, he come, he just runs into the ring and starts attacking both guys. Of course, he's angry about what happened to Cactus and Chainsaw and stuff. And so Owen starts off you know, fighting Billy on the outside and stuff, but eventually they get into the ring. And Road Dog at one point ends up attacking Owen Hart from behind because Billy Gunn has the ref distracted. And in the ring, Owen ends up putting the sharpshooter on Billy Gunn. But as he does that, Road Dog jumps into the ring. So Owen lets go and starts dealing with Road Dog. And of course, that causes a distraction and whatever and stuff. So the ref throws it out with a DQ, giving Owen the win there. And as soon as that happens, DX comes running down and they start attacking Owen as well. And so it's Sean and, and Triple H. And I think China gets involved at some point too. And then the Outlaws and stuff and so they start fighting with him up to the top of the ramp and they get him up there and triple h hits a ddt on him on the stage so like the metal whatever stuff they have all over the stage and then the outlaws grab their hands and so you know one grabs his hands and one grabs his feet and they pick it lift him up off the ground and they just start swinging him back and forth and they're you know pointing to like throw him off to the front of the stage so like towards the ring area and so they're like swinging him and they're going you know one two three and as soon as they hit three a bunch of officials come running out and they grab a hold of him to make him drop Owen Hart and stuff and they end up just pushing him out to the out of the way and stuff to help Owen and DX and Triple it or DX and Outlaws just kind of like have fun with each other whatever saying you know that was cool just kind of like celebrating and so that ends off that match. And then we come back and commentary is talking about the events that took place and so they're replaying, you know, the dumpster going off the side of the stage. And then eventually Michael Cole comes on on the phone and it's mentioned that, you know, he went to the hospital with um, Cactus and Chainsaw and he comes in saying, you know, that he's there but nothing has been um, updated, that they have the guys, you know, in rooms or whatever looking after him but nothing has happened yet. And so he'll come back when there's more info to give. And we go to the next match of Mosh coming out with Thrasher, taking on Mark. Marrow, of course, coming out with Sable. But uh, they come out to the ring and Marrow makes Sable put on one of his like boxing robes and then take his rope off. And then he tells her to get out of the ring. And when she's getting out of the ring, someone brings more stuff to her. And it's a heart-shaped box of chocolates and stuff. And, of course, that makes Marrow mad. So he tells her to go to the back and stuff. And as she's walking up the ramp, um, he yells out saying, you know, you look like you've put on a few pounds, which is... You know, kind of harsh to say to a, a lady on television, but um, he says that, of course, trying to get more heel heat. And he says, you know, if I'm going to have somebody at ringside, I want someone that I know that I can trust and is going to watch, watch my back. And so I'm going to bring out somebody named Marilyn. And so then you hear Goldust music start and he comes out and he's dressed as Marilyn Manson and commentary calls him Marilyn Dust as they do. They keep saying whatever. Like when he dressed as Vader last week, they called him Vader Dust and stuff. And so he's now, Goldust is now known as Marilyn Dust. But in the match, nothing exciting really goes on. But Marrow ends up hitting the low blow on Mosh to get the win when Mosh was distracted by Thrasher and Goldust on the outside fighting. So Mero hit the low blow and rolled him up to get the win. So Mero got the win there. And then we go to the back with Barry Windham on. It's like doing a whole split screen type thing. So Barry Windham and the all the NWA guys are in one picture. And Brad Shaw's in the locker room in the other picture. And JR's just talking about him. And Barry Windham's just blaming Brad Shaw for them losing all the time. And that um, he just kind of got rid of the thing holding him back. And so that, make, of course, makes Bradshaw mad. So he challenges him to a fight. And when it's like, you know what? We'll do that. You can find a partner if you can. And we'll have a tag match tonight. Then we go to a video package on Tiger Ali Singh, which of course was a new wrestler coming in. He wasn't allowed around for very long, but this is like the first vignette that I've seen of him, you know, just kind of telling you who he is and stuff. He looks a lot like Rusev, I noticed, um, but just kind of showing that he's some rich like millionaire guy and stuff and that he's going to be a new person in the WWF. Then we go to our next match of Fruit coming out with the Nation of Domination taking on Chains who comes out with the DOA, other two DOA members, Ahmed Johnson and Ken Shamrock. And so as the match starts, commentary mentions that these teams will be having a match at No Way Out. I think it's called a War of Attrition match, so I don't know exactly what it's supposed to mean. But in the actual match, it's pretty boring. Nothing 
good or amazing happens. Um, Michael Cole calls back on the phone and he mentions that Terry Funk is awake, but Mick is still unconscious. So in the actual match towards the end, uh, Farouk's bouncing off the ropes and Kama grabs his leg, I believe thinking that it was chains that he was grabbing onto, but it was Farouk. And so that causes Farouk to get out of the ring and start yelling at Kama and get up all on his face. And so because of that, chains is able to get the win because Farouk got counted out by the referee because he was outside arguing with Kama. And then that kind of causes a fight. I don't know if they actually start like punching each other and stuff, but it looked like it. But the other nation members get in between them and start separating them and stuff. And they get up to the, start leaving the ringside and stuff and up the ramp. And they end up doing the whole, they all, you know, spread out and do the whole lineup thing. And with Farouk in the center, and they do the whole fist raising thing, trying to show that Farouk is still in control of the team. Then we go to our next match, which is the tag team match. So it's Barry Windham and Jeff Jarrett taking on Bradshaw, and his partner is Flash Funk. So, of course, Barry Windham and Jeff Jarrett come out with Jim Cornette and the Rock and Roll Express and stuff, so all of them are out there as well. Um, but early in the match, Rock and Roll Express on the outside are attacking Flash Funk, and they end up picking him up and dropping Flash on the railing, like on his neck. And so Flash is then selling an injury and everything, and so he's not able to continue in the match, so a bunch of refs come out, and they're checking on him, and they eventually carry him out, and so he doesn't get to be in the match at all. So it's Bradshaw all by himself against all of the NWA guys. And so pretty early on, Wyndham like keeps avoiding Bradshaw, so every time Bradshaw gets the upper hand, he starts to go for Wyndham, you know, standing on the outside waiting to be tagged in, and Wyndham will back off and uh, he keeps avoid getting tagged in and stuff because like he doesn't want to be in the ring with Bradshaw. But eventually Cornette causes a distraction on the referee and the NWA guys come in and just start attacking Bradshaw on the outside. Which then from there, Wyndham does get in the match or will be in the match from then on since they have the upper hand. But eventually Bradshaw is able to get the la or hit the lariat on Jeff Jarrett and is able to get the win off that. And so Bradshaw's in of course continues just to fight and he's holding Jeff Jarrett. I forget what he, oh I think he's just doing like the double hands around the neck holding him up in the air. And Jim Cornette comes in from behind and hits Bradshaw with the racket which causes him to drop Jarrett. And then all the NWA starts fighting on and beating up Bradshaw and Jarrett ends up putting the figure four on him and Ricky Morton ends up holding his hands and Barry Windham starts to do splashes on top of Bradshaw so he'll run across the ring and back and then do a splash on him and stuff and since Jarrett's holding the figure four it's hurting his Bradshaw's leg and they're missing that he had knee surgery and all sorts of stuff and then Ricky holding his hand so he can't help himself get free and everything and so they just really put the beating on Bradshaw. And then we go back to commentary and they're talking to Michael Cole again on the phone and Cole just mentioning that all hell is broken loose at the hospital and that police have shown up but he doesn't know any more than that of what's going on. And then we come back and in the ring is some guy named Wink Collins. I don't know why he's in the ring or why he's there but it said something about he's from the something with the WWF. Then they're talking about WrestleMania but he's talking about how the remaining tickets for WrestleMania went on sale and they went out in 90 seconds so wrestlemania is now sold out but he's advertising you know that but if you can't be there don't forget you can get the show on pay-per-view and just talking about the whole thing and as he's doing that the lights end up going out and kane's music starts playing and kane and paul bear come out to the ring and they get in the ring and Kane grabs Wink to do the choke slam and you know grab him by the neck and get ready to pick him up. But before he can, Vader's music starts playing and Vader comes out to the ring. And he comes out, grabs a microphone, and he challenges Kane to a match at No Way Out. And so Paul Bear kind of like agrees to the match and stuff. And so Vader's like, but I'm going to put your fire out tonight or something like that. And he goes over and grabs a fire extinguisher and then sprays it in Kane's face and just keeps doing that. And the commentary is mentioned, you know, he's spraying Kane in his one eye because they're playing that Kane is missing an eye or whatever from being burned and everything. And so we have Vader getting revenge on Kane and spraying him with fire extinguisher. And then we go to our main event for the night, which is Road Dog, of course, coming out with Billy Gunn, and they're taking on Stone Cold. And so as Stone Cold comes out to the ring, he attacks both the guys because they're both kind of on the outside. But because there's two of them against one, the Outlaws are able to do attacks on Stone Cold, allowing Road Dog to get the upper hand. But soon after the match, and not much goes on in it, um, the DX ends up coming out and they start attacking Stone Cold as well. And so because of that, the refs throw out the match. And so they're all in the ring beating up on Stone Cold. And they push him up against the ropes and uh, tie, tying him up in the ropes. So you're doing the thing where his arms are, you know, caught up in the ropes and stuff. And so the outlaws are holding him so he can't get up and stuff. And Sean just gets up in Stone Cold's face and is, you know, cutting a promo on him. 
Until all of a sudden, Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie come walking down the ramp, and they're, I know Chainsaw's in, like, a hospital gown and stuff, and Cactus just you know, has some of his gear off and stuff. I know he's not wearing shoes and everything. And they come out, and of course, with weapons and stuff, and, you know, the outlaws and uh, DX notices, so they escape the ring and go... Um, running past him and stuff escaping and it was mentioned by commentary during the match that an ambulance had showed up in the back but they didn't know why and stuff they're like uh, maybe they're preparing for what stone cold's gonna do to the outlaws or something like that i think is what their excuse was and stuff but they had mentioned that an ambulance had showed up in the back so obviously it's supposed to be that cactus and chainsaw escaped with an ambulance and came back to the arena and so Stone Cold kind of also chased the um, DX out because he was able to get free while they were the outlaws and DX were distracted by Cactus and Chainsaw come down. And so he was able to escape and kind of chased after him. Well, he ended up coming back down the ramp and he had one of, I believe it was Sean's shirt. It could have been Triple H's, but he had one of their shirts in his hands that got ripped off. And so he holds it up and just rips it in half and stuff, you know, kind of showing that they beat him or whatever and stuff. And so, like I said, that to me was a good show, like I said, with the whole DX thing, which is a pretty memorable part of the attitude era and then the whole dumpster thing with cactus jack and chainsaw Charlie and stuff was a big thing of course that plays into the wrestlemania match between them and the outlaws and the dumpster match and stuff that like i said wrestlemania 14 was one i've watched many many times because i had the movie of it and stuff so i'd watch it all the time but like i said that show overall was really good again i don't know what happened on nitro i doubt anything big happened i'm gonna try and like find stuff to read up on it so if anything big does happen i can go and watch that episode but obviously since it was so nice not having to watch nitro this week like i watched raw you know felt good it was a good episode and stuff and then usually after you know that happens i'm like oh now i gotta watch nitro and stuff but not doing it i just felt so good i'm like wait i'm done i don't have to watch any more of the old wrestling stuff i don't have to spend you know a whole over two hours for nitro and everything but that's going to be it for this Monday Night Rewind part. And so now we're going to hit that fast forward button and come into 2018 where we're going to cover some modern stuff. It is what we're going to call the fast forward section. So we're hitting the rewind and fast forward. But first, before we bring in my brother and stuff and introduce him into the show and everything, going to kind of make sure you check out some stuff. So don't forget you can subscribe and download the show on the Monday Night Rewind podcast on iTunes on the podcast apps. You can search for it there and subscribe and get the show downloaded every time post you can listen to it and follow us on soundcloud where you can also listen to the show that's the main host site for the podcast and then don't forget you can also find the video on youtube where you can listen to it and don't forget to subscribe there as well and then in the links in below you can find us and help support us through patreon and teespring you can find you know support through patreon with a donation or buy a shirt on teespring and you can get the podcast logo shirt there on teespring or and don't forget to follow us on twitter and facebook at awesome Air show which you can also find those links down in the description so don't forget to do as much of that stuff as you can for us to help support us and help us grow and i think that's going to be it so now we're going to move on to the fast forward section so i'm back here now with mav as you may know bro from videos what's up so now we're just going to be going over kind of like the top stories of events that went on in current wrestling so this is 2018 so we're in the fast forward section now as i said so coming into the modern day um, so I'm just going to kind of go, I believe it's like chronological order and stuff. So we'll start with WWE with their big stuff. So we'll go ahead and start over with NXT TakeOver. So what'd you think of the show? Uh, I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, as usual, the TakeOvers are always like some of the best shows you'll see and stuff. Um, so some of the big stuff that came out of the show is, um, of course, as they do a lot with big shows, they'll do um, the people sitting in the crowd or whatever. So the wrestlers that are coming in, they done it with... Uh, what's his name drew galloway or whatever his name is and they've done it with uh, shinsuke they did it with bobby Roode. they've done it with all a bunch of stars and stuff of just showing them sitting in the crowd you know watching the matches or whatever stuff so in the show we got first was war machine so i thought that was pretty cool do you have an opinion on war machine um it'll be interesting to see how war machine plays out especially Especially since, uh, I don't know what his name is on NXT, but Big Damo, he's a part yeah. of Sanity. He has almost the same Yeah, they look, him and, uh... Hanson. Hanson, yeah, look almost exactly the same. So that's gonna be interesting, and, um... I feel, though, by the time they start on stuff, Sanity may be moved because of that, how similar they are. But you never know exactly how they're going to do stuff. But, yeah, um, I think that's pretty cool. I mean, they're big in Japan and stuff like that and have been in the um, U.S. independence and stuff like that. Um, as far as I've heard from Ruben and stuff, doing really good and stuff. We've seen them on 
Ring of Honor, and we saw them at a Ring of Honor show and stuff, and I thought they were entertaining and, then and stuff. they've got a pretty big following in uh, New Japan, so. Um, but yeah, so. And then uh, next up we got Trevor Ricochet Man, or Ricochet Prince Puma, whatever you may know him as on the indies. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool that they showed him, which I mean, obviously this is all, these two are both old news, like it was announced a couple weeks ago, or whatever, through WWE and stuff, that they're coming in. So are you happy about Ricochet? I am happy because Ricochet is a talented athlete, but with them burying guys in 205 now, I'm kind of worried about that. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. Like, Ricochet, by what I've seen, is um, really good. He's, you know, a high flyer type person. I've heard him on a podcast stuff saying, you know, that he's trying to get, like, less than that for, you know, like, health reasons and stuff like that as he's getting older. But he's still really amazing and stuff, but... Yeah, if he gets stuck in 205 Live, I'm afraid, unless he gets put in there, and of course with their switching up of stuff that they're doing that we'll talk about in a little bit, unless that like helps turn around 205, and maybe, like I said, if not, when he comes in, if that helps, um, I feel it's just going to go down the drain stuff. But I mean, even though if he gets put on the main roster, he's such a small guy, I doubt he'll get moved anywhere. Or not. And then the last person we saw, which was right before the main event, was EC3, Ethan Carter the Third. of course. Made his name in TNA as Dixie Carter's nephew. Was, what was his name in NXT before? Derek Bateman? Yeah, from, that was probably, what, 2010-ish? Or 11 that he left? Uh, might have been even Because I thought on that. something it said five years, but I'm like, I remember back five years. I don't remember him since then. But yeah, so he made his appearance, so... Um, people were speculating stuff, and I believe there was rumor that he was at the Performance Center and stuff. Um, so, but that just proved that he did sign with WWE and is going to be in NXT and stuff. So that'll be interesting to see if they continue over his character. Of course, with the whole TNA or Impact stuff, that he's allowed to keep his character and all that sort of stuff. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they treat him and if, like I said, if he continues it on. And then, of course, the rumors or not rumors, but speculations, but like you know, maybe they could bring Dixie in as like a as his aunt or whatever at s certain times, you know, as a heel, like, or a heater for him, I guess is what they call it, to, you know, get more heel heat on him if he's a heel and stuff like that, because people don't like her. Um, so overall, I think TakeOver had a lot of good matches. Um, I don't remember a whole lot about a bunch of them, so I can't really, like, go into detail, really, about any of them, but I know the Adam Cole and Aleister Black match got a good reviews and stuff like that that it was a really good match and that um we got apparently from the thing i heard that adam cole like did more of his old stuff where it was rumored you know prior to going to nxt and stuff he had like kind of slowed his stuff down to what they call the wwe style of wrestling and that this was him and his old style where he was just doing crazy stuff and everything but um i just remember it was you know a decent match and stuff but i didn't really notice anything amazing about did you really notice anything it was a good match i just felt it was weird with them allowing them to do the hardcore aspect almost yeah uh, i don't know if it was a street fight or yeah, it what a, it was um, no dq but, extreme rules oh uh, wasn't it yeah. but i mean i felt it was weird because i feel alistair and adam cole could have had a good pure wrestling match between the two of yeah. them yeah um, but, of course, the thing everyone's talking about is the Cian Almas versus Johnny Gargano match, which I remember or I remember watching pretty much all of that and stuff. Of course, I can't go into all the details and everything. But from what I saw, I thought it was really good. And, of course, it's got what? What was it got Dave Meltzer? Five, five, Meltzer gave it a five-star five star. rating. So, of course, that's a high rating and stuff like that. And I believe, yeah, it deserved every star of that. And I just thought it was amazing, like... Um, of course, I've known about Gargano, obviously, being through NXT and everything, and so I didn't have anything, like, you know, worries about him being good or anything like that, and he's got, you know, the nickname Johnny Wrestling and stuff, so I assume if you have that nickname, you're a good wrestler and all that, but almost was the one that, you know, we were, like, kind of questioning and stuff. It's like, we haven't really seen anything amazing. We know he was from LIJ, or do you want to say it? Los Ingobernables. Yeah, you actually said it right. Um... And so, of course, he was in that as, we believe, think his name was La Sombra or something like that. But he wore a mask and stuff. He was a luchador in there. But now he came to NXT. He let, lost the mask or took the mask off or whatever coming in to NXT and stuff. And so he's been decent, I think. Like, I forget which match it was. But he had a match. I don't know if it was the uh, match with, I uh, can't think of his name, Austin Aries. And so I remember, I think it was that match but I thought almost looked, you know, 
you know, I thought he did a really good job there and kind of raised my eye to him and stuff like that. But then afterwards, he had other matches where he started to do the whole, like, he didn't care about stuff and did the whole Tranquilo thing and stuff. But then they brought in Zelina Vega that started yelling at him and all sorts of stuff, which was Austin Aries' wife or fiance or something, I believe. And she started turning him around and stuff. And so... Um, he won the match, of course, against Galloway or whatever his name, McIntyre, I guess is his name, and at the last takeover, so he won the title during that match, and so I'm like, I don't know how good of a champion he's going to be, so I figured, you know, he'd probably lose it at this uh, takeover, or at least probably by WrestleMania, And the, but once they said Gar- Gargano, I was like, well, he's, you know, good enough wrestler to be the champion, but I don't know if they're going to give him the title or not, so it was interesting to see how the match played out, but then it did, and I thought it was pretty good. And, I mean, obviously got the stars and everything. And, of course, we had the um, interruptions or whatever and stuff with Zelina Vega and Gargano's wife. Candice. Yeah, Candice LeRae and stuff. And so I just thought it was um, a really good match and stuff, obviously. Like I said, it's got five stars, so it's going to be a really good match. But um, I liked Almas' uh, finisher, the Hammerlock DDT. I'd never really seen it. Obviously, I've seen DDTs and stuff. But I thought it was interesting. And um, so... I just, to me, that raised um, almost his stock, for me at least, a lot. And now I really want to see him take on a um, Los and Gobernables, like, like persona type thing. Like, to show draw more attention to that, since they're doing stuff like that with Bullet Club, or the club, whatever, with Finn Balor and stuff like that now. It'd kind of be cool to see him kind of do the Naito, where he just kind of, like, drags the title yeah. around and throws it. Yeah. That would be kind of just cool like to see. Yeah, just, like, pay homage to his partners, you know, and stuff from New Japan and stuff. Um, so I don't know of anything else beyond TakeOver. I don't think any titles changed, because I know the tag stayed on Fish and O'Reilly against the Author's Pain. Um, Ember Moon retained against Shayna Baszler, and those are the only titles they have besides the top title. And none of those other matches, I think, were anything amazing. And I don't know of anything else. So that was probably it for TakeOver of all the notable stuff. And then we'll, of course, move on to the Royal Rumble, which was the next night. And we'll start with the Men's Royal Rumble, which, of course, saw the um, Nakamura be the last person there to win the match and stuff, which I was excited for. I don't know how you I don't, how you feel about Nakamura. He's okay, but I prefer more like an AJ Styles. When Austin was there, I liked Austin Aries, uh, Sami Zayn, like... I feel WWE has fed a bunch of wrestlers to Nakamura, and then once he got to that uh, main event status, they've kind of fluctuated on him back and forth, especially with the small... Didn't he have a small feud with Baron Corbin? Yeah. Yeah, like, Baron was never on Nakamura's level, but they gave Baron a fighting chance against him, so... Yeah, well, of course, that's the big thing with WWE and or the talk about them, how they've kind of, everyone feels they've like messed up Nakamura or there's something wrong going on with Nakamura. But of course, he is a Japanese wrestler. He doesn't speak much English and what he does sometimes doesn't sound very good. So that's going to hurt in WWE where mostly everything, at least in the past, has been based off promos and stuff. So that kind of knocks him down there. But, of course, I'm always as a... Because I'm a fan of Nakamura, unlike um, you, Matt. But I've, of course, been a fan of Nakamura since Wrestle Kingdom 9 when we watched that and stuff. Seeing that match with Kota Ibushi. You know, seeing these people the first time, I never knew anything about them. Didn't know their names or anything. And just seeing that match. And to me, that's the best wrestling match I've ever seen out of any match I've ever watched in the history of my uh, wrestling history. Um, and so, to me, Nakamura and both Ibushi are both top in there. But, of course, Nakamura is the person I came out as liking more and stuff. So, once I heard he was coming to WWE, I was excited. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to see this guy. And since then, he's just not done hardly anything. I mean, as far as I can remember, he's doing the exact same stuff. They're just not, um, he's just not connecting or whatever the way that he did in New Japan. Which, of course, could be a part of the whole background and stuff like that. Then, of course, we had the Women's Royal Rumble, which had a very similar thing with Asuka being the winner, which I was fine and I believed was going to happen as it had been reported that people believed it was going to be Asuka and stuff. I felt the Women's Royal Rumble was okay. Uh, They had a bunch of legends in there and they were sloppy, which that was the whole problem back during the Divas Divas era was... You had women that would wrestle, air quotes there, but they were sloppy, and now you've got all these actual entertainers or wrestlers, whatever WWE wants to call them, and they can actually go and do good jobs, 
But I think I counted it up and there were six or seven spots that were taken by old legends like Tori Wilson. That Which I've seen stuff on the internet. People believe that wasn't really Tori Wilson because they... Because they took pictures of her from the old days and with the pictures of her now and she looks absolutely nothing alike. It's like, you know, even if you get plastic surgery and stuff, you'd still have some physical appearances of yourself. But I thought it looked like Tori. I mean, I mean, I had no clue who it was until her name popped up on the screen. But like, <laughs> I had no, you had, no clue. You had Kelly Kelly in the match. I mean, Lita. Well, they probably just p- people that came back that could still be because they had a lot of spots to fill, which they could have filled with. May Young classic people or NXT people, but exactly. for some reason they like, chose a bunch of older one women. Of, one of the rumors for the Rumble was uh, the iconic duo. Yeah. Which, me personally, I feel bad for them because they've been in NXT so long and NXT keeps dropping the ball on them. They are entertaining as heels. They almost have that Layla, Michelle Cool aspect to them when they were Lay Cool. But they're actually better wrestlers than Michelle McCool and Layla were. Yeah, I didn't have a problem. Like, I mean, as long as an older woman didn't win, I didn't have a problem with it. I mean, it was fun to see. Because, obviously, a lot of women I didn't pay much attention to in the past and stuff. Because, you know, it wasn't that good. So, it was fun to see old people brought back. Um, But, of course, then we had people like Trish Stratus, which I thought... Did probably the best out of all the old legend people that came back. I feel legend-wise, she was okay because she kind of sets the top of the division. Yeah. But like I said earlier, Lita, I don't know how I feel because she was one of those, but she had a history of injuries. And that's... And yeah, to me, she, she not all her stuff looked that good <laughs> that she was doing it. Of course, she did the bat or the moonsault or whatever that yeah. looked weird. And I mean, she already did that once or something, broke her neck or whatever in the past. So it was weird seeing that. And she almost messed it up again. And but then you did have the two legends that I was happy to see. You had Jacqueline Moore. Yeah. And then Molly Holly. Yeah. Those are two of the women who back in the day of the yeah, Divas could, could actually go. But they didn't have... Well, I mean, Jackie was the champion, but like, and Molly Holly probably was too. I don't know. But they, since they didn't have the exact looks, though, they weren't pushed that hard and stuff. But so, and then it came down, of course, the Nikki, Bella, and Oscar. And so it was a good thing that Oscar won. Cause once it came down to them, I'm like, they could put this on Nikki or let her win and stuff to go to the championship match or whatever and stuff. But they gave it to Asuka as it should be and stuff. And so she won the match. And then, of course, they get to choose their person they're fighting. So, of course, we got forgot to mention that Nakamura said he's facing AJ, which was the match people want to see because they had a um, what I've heard is a really good match in New Japan, but I had never saw it. And so it's been, it'll be nice to see them do that again. And hopefully this will get Nakamura to that level that I know he can do or be at and stuff. So hopefully that'll help. But Asuka, went, you know, of course, went to do the whole choosing thing. And it got interrupted by Ronda Rousey coming out, you know, signifying or whatever that she's now in the WWE and that she's kept pointing at the WrestleMania sign all weird and stuff. And uh, that she's going to wrestle, going to WrestleMania at least, but nothing was ever mentioned of who she's facing. People are saying, oh, she looked at Charlotte. Charlotte, yeah. But she also looked at the other girls and then she tried to shake Asuka's hand and stuff. So, I mean... To me, if anything, it's indicating Asuka, which I don't think should be the match because Asuka is undefeated and Rousey coming in, I doubt would lose automatically the first time. And so that's just a bad combination. But people are like, oh, it's Charlotte. I mean, yeah, that's been the rumor. It's going to be them. But I didn't see any more attention towards Charlotte than anybody else. But so, yeah, we're going to have Ronda Rousey come in at some point. Apparently she signed full time because that was the big thing going around after the Rumble that she signed full time, but she wasn't on Raw, which I mean, I know she's filming a movie right now. So maybe once that's done, but I assume they'd want to save her for a pay-per-view or something for the first time. I don't know. I don't know. I know I've got an unpopular opinion on this because I'm not a fan of Ronda Rousey. Well, I'm, I don't care. That's my opinion, is I don't care. I mean, I know she's a name, and that'll bring people in, so I guess in that instance, it's good, because I know it'll bring eyes, possibly. I mean, obviously, it'll bring eyes to, like, Rawls and stuff, stuff that's free, but stuff that you have to pay for, like WrestleMania and stuff, I don't know how many eyes it'll bring. But I just have no opinion on Rousey. I don't, I don't care about UFC and all that stuff. Like, I know she was undefeated for a long time but then she lost her last two matches but other than that like i don't 
I could care less. I mean, I don't, like I said, if she did like face Asuka, I wouldn't like if she came in and won and beat Asuka. But if, like I know, whole rumor thing is that, oh, maybe she'll do a match with her and some partner against Triple H and Stephanie, then yeah, she can beat Stephanie all she wants. I don't care about that. My opinion on this is she does not deserve that top spot. WWE has an issue of just taking big names and throwing them up near the top. She should have started off in NXT like Shayna Baszler did. Shayna Baszler is an MMA fighter and she's, and she's working been, through NXT. Well, she's also been on independence and yeah. stuff. And the past but Rousey. Ronda Rousey hasn't but, done anything. I mean, you never know with Rousey. She could be like a Kurt Angle and just pick up wrestling and she could be really good. And then if, if she is good, then I think she deserves it. But if she's... You know, mediocre at best or at the level she to come in where she did out of nowhere. I mean, you have a name Royal Rumble, and then to possibly get one of the top spots, which we know that taking spots from wrestlers has been an issue in the past. Yeah, but I mean, as long but it's with wrestling though, it should be though as long as it makes you money, you shouldn't care. And if it does bring in more people, that'll make everyone more money. But I feel because of payoffs her, from the shows and stuff. But I feel you never know. putting her on NXT would have been better because then you'd have to pay for the network to watch her yeah. start out. If you want to go the money aspect, then you'd have to pay to watch her, and that's only nine ninety nine yeah. or what it, they did raise it. So I don't know what it is anymore. But I don't know. I. I feel really bad for, like, the Ember Moons or Candice LeRae, who just came in, who's worked for years on the independents. Let's say a lot more people don't know Rousey than they do. That's the thing. Depending, I you mean... No, like, between wrestling fans, yeah, like, at least hardcore fans, If, if you're talking yeah, they about the Candace. media, yes, it'll but pull yes, names that's what they. that's WWE. who they're trying to pull, to pull in, though, is the people that don't normally watch wrestling. And so if they're not watching wrestling, they're not paying attention to independence. That's stuff. fine. Saying her name is attached to WWE NXT yeah. and still yeah, pull I people think to that, WWE. I think that would be fine, is bringing her in the NXT. I think that'd be perfectly fine. But they, obviously, she's such a big name, they're not going to... Th- waste that on her and, and stuff. then i feel ronda's got the brock lesnar attitude where they don't have the best attitude towards other people which is what's off-putting to me about both lesnar and rousey you're these big public figures but you actually have bad attitudes towards a lot of people yeah so i don't know anything about rousey or rousey in that terms but i know it's been mentioned she said you know she's been a wrestling fan for most of her life so that's unlike brock where brock probably didn't give a shit about wrestling until um it was suggested to him that hey maybe you should try this wrestling thing and he did so that's the only thing i think is more positive about rousey um, so then, of course, that leads into Raw the next night, which nothing really major happened. On, like, Oh, wait, we did forget the uh, championship match between Brock Lesnar, Braun Strowman, and Kane oh, yeah. at Rumble. So, yeah, obviously, Braun ju- or Brock just retained. We had the issues between Brock and Braun. Which, with Braun being newer to the company, being green, coming from a strongman background, I can understand that. But for Brock to be an MMA fighter and then actually get hit kind of hard and turn around well, and punch the guy right in the face. I mean, you hear that about that in wrestling, though. Like, any, like, because I obviously listen to a bunch of podcasts. And so, any old wrestler, like Stone Cold or anything, when they talk about getting a receipt, so if someone stiffs you in the ring, you're going to get a receipt back on them or, by hitting or them back. As some of them call it getting hit with a potato. Yeah. And so but, if if someone there's... hits you, you just pay them back because they should know that it's coming since you hit them. And so I think Brock had every right to hit him. I mean, he, I don't think he should have made it as obvious as they did, <laughs> well, especially as... with slowing, doing slow-mo on it and everything. But... And then him saying what he said to Braun Strowman, which it wasn't audible, but you, if you go back and watch it, you can clearly see what he said well, I mean, to Braun, and I'm not going to repeat that. You but... can hear You can hear people say stuff all the time. Like I said, I think it was fine. I mean... Yeah, maybe, you know, being Brock and stuff, you shouldn't be punch people. I mean, we don't obviously know. He did knock him out. So he did knock him out, and he and supposedly he hit him in the ear. I didn't see his ear bleeding or anything. So, But he does have that cauliflower ear, yeah, but well, still. Well, that's going to happen from even yeah. people doing stuff that just happens. So as long as Braun isn't, like, severely injured, I don't see anything wrong with it. Um, but pretty much on all, we got the um, announcements of the Elimination Chamber. So we got matches for the guys for the Elimination Chamber. So I... 
I'm not sure I'm going to be able to remember them all, but we had Elias versus Matt Hardy, and Elias ended up winning, so he's going to be in the Elimination Chamber. Which I do like that, because like I've told you, Elias has the look that WWE likes, Yeah, which I'm not always the biggest fan of the super muscular guy, but he's got a personality that yeah, wins Yeah, he's entertaining and stuff. Um, so that'll be interesting to see, especially if they keep him in it. Because obviously stuff like this, like the week before, someone could take him out and be like, I'm taking his spot and stuff. Um, but so he's in there. And then the only other match I can remember is the John Cena versus Finn Balor. That was the main event. And of course, Cena went over there, which I don't under, I mean, I can understand Cena being in the match. And I heard, you know, how he was reacting and stuff during the match that people believe that this is leading towards something with Cena. Like, of, of course, obviously, though, he's rumored a possible heel turn because the way he was acting to the crown stuff, like looking at him all weird and this, how he did stuff to Finn, that it, there seems to be something deeper going on with Cena and stuff than just winning. But I still think they should have been in separate matches where Finn won his match and got to be in the chamber and Cena won his match to be in the chamber. I'm just tired of WWE being wish-washy on Finn Balor. Yeah. It's, you you see the dirt sheets and the rumor mill and stuff say, oh, WWE believes Finn's not getting over. Finn has one of the best crowd reactions, and plus when you pair him with Gallows and Anderson as the club, there's nothing better. They missed a major spot at the Rumble by not because AJ did have his match before the Rumble. They should have put AJ in there, and they could have had all four members of the X-Bullet Club do something, and the place would have exploded. Yeah. But, so, they, it was just interesting. Like, I don't know what they're doing to Finn. Like, then, of course, been stuff. Well, maybe they're turning Finn heel because apparently when he was in New Japan, when they started the whole Bullet Club stuff, they were a heel group. And that f supposedly Finn's, like, promos and stuff were really good and everything. And so maybe they're just going to try and, you know, like, tap into that stuff to help Finn. But I don't know. I don't think it's over for Finn and stuff, obviously. But it would have been nice to see him in the chamber. Um, but then, of course, we got the announcement of the women's Elimination Chamber for the first time. We didn't get any matches for that, though. Or if they're just going to randomly pick girls to be in it or whatever. Well, what, an Elimination Chamber is, what, six people? Yeah. And that I know of, there's only seven or eight yeah, people that's right. on the roster. I forgot about that. So. And so I don't know if that's going to be a pay-per-view they bring Rousey in for. I don't. Like I said, I assume they'll just wait till WrestleMania, but... Um, cause you would think with it being her name and stuff, she'd be on the raw brand, but of course if she's going to do something with Charlotte, it's like, well then she needs to be on SmackDown, but I don't think they'd waste her on SmackDown. So I don't know. Um, but then of course we had the match between Asuka and, uh, Sasha Banks, which, um, by all accounts was a really good match and everything. But of course we had Sasha, I don't know if it was an intended move. Cause I think when she did it, Asuka like hit her. And when she did a dive through the ropes, or if um, it just happened, but she like pretty much just fell on her head, and people thought she broke her neck, and the referee ran over there too and stuff to make sure she was okay. Um, but it just looked nasty. But Sasha's done similar, not similar moves, but that's, that's similar things thing. in the past. That, as long as Sasha stays on the ground, she's good. It's when she goes up to the top rope or tries the dives that she always botches. And it looks like she kills herself. Yeah. WWE needs to tell her to stop that stuff. Yeah, she, she just has to be careful. Or she's like, going to end up with a serious injury. Like when her and Charlotte had that match uh, a couple years ago and they were on the top yeah. rope and she got dropped weird. That's what I'm talking about. If she stays on the ground, she's fine. Yeah. So that's the kind of interesting stuff. So we're now going to have elimination chamber with women, which it'll be interesting to see how they do that and stuff. But I don't think an elimination chamber is like their level enough or whatever yet for women to be in that. Like it was weird to see a hell in a cell, but now an elimination chamber, it's all steel everywhere. And especially with Sasha, that's probably going to be in it and doing that sort of crap. I don't want to see that in an elimination, in an elimination chamber. It'll be interesting to see Oscar. In an elimination chamber just because no one yeah. can run from her. So she's going to have five other opponents she could beat the crap yeah. out of. Um, but then we'll go and move to SmackDown, which uh, nothing really big on SmackDown happened as it usually never does anymore. Um, the only thing was with the main event and the announcements throughout the show. So um, because the whole Sammy Zayn and Kevin Owens stuff from the 
Royal Rumble and stuff where of course they lost to AJ but the wrong or non-legal person was in the ring and got pinned and stuff there of course were fighting with Daniel Bryan and stuff about wanting a rematch and sort of stuff and so Bryan made a match for a number one contendership next I think it's next week and it's going to be for between Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens so it's going to make them face each other so they started to like kind of present that there was issues between himself like I know they did some backstage stuff where they were like arguing with each other and then during their main event match on Smackdown Sammy got mad about something and just left the ring and went up he went up and stood at the top of the ramp at one point and ended up running back down to help out Kevin who was getting pinned and stuff so it break up the pin then a little bit later he got mad again so he went all the way to the back and was shown standing in the back watching the match so they're presenting a lot of issues between Sam and K- Sammy and Kevin, which it could just be, you know, them playing it up. And, you know, next week it could be a whole DX thing where they go into the match and let's say Kevin lays down and let Sammy pin him or whatever, just to be ridiculous like Sean and Triple H did back in the um, old shows and stuff. Because there is rumors, you know, that Kevin has a back injury and so they're trying to let him not do as much to help get that heel and stuff. So it'd be make more sense for Sammy to get the match and stuff. So it could be that, or they could be pushing issues between each other and actually breaking them up and, you know, lead to another or to a WrestleMania match between the two, which they've had awesome matches in the past. So that'll be another great match added on to WrestleMania. Maybe we can get a Ladders War 4. Yeah. That would be amazing. So it's kind of unclear, obviously, with WWE, they like to switch stuff around and everything all the time. So either thing could be possible because obviously those are the two options right now um but it'll we'll just have to see next week what happens and stuff and going on to that pay-per-view match at whatever the fast lane or whatever it is just a quick thought something if i was on the uh creative team that uh number one contenders match next week i would have some interference from dolph ziggler then you could turn it into a three-way match and yeah See if maybe WWE could reignite that spark that they're having issues with Dolph Ziggler. I don't care about... That's my opinion of Dolph Ziggler. I could care less about him. Like, if I never see him again in a ring, I could care less. Um, But that's just my opinion. Um, So that was pretty much the only big news we got from SmackDown. Of course, it goes then to 205 Live, which usually has nothing either. But we did have Dan O'Brien introducing their new general manager, which is Rockstar Spud, or in this case, they're naming him Drake Maverick. Um, So that's kind of interesting. Like, we heard that Spud had signed with WWE or was leaving um, Impact or whatever to go to WWE. So I just assume he would be in 205 Live or something like that as a competitor. But apparently he's going to be the GM of 205 Live. So hopefully that will help 205 Live out maybe giving some more personality on the show. Well then didn't we also have the TJ Perkins versus uh, Tyler Bate match on 205? Yeah they had that which Tyler Bate lost. Which I mean I thought it was cool that... They brought the you know the UK guy Tyler Bay into 205 Live, but then they had him lose to TJP, which has been losing a lot of his matches lately. So I you know assume they were building up something with TJP for him losing a lot, which I mean he has, I think he's turned heel again or something. I don't know, um, but I think Tyler Bate should have won that match. But- yeah, it's 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 weird how WWE handles their characters like in the UK Championship. Tyler Bate is, like, the second best guy to be yeah. done. But in 205, where he should be dominant because he can handle the heavyweights, he pretty much gets squashed by TJP. Yeah. Which is ridiculous. Um, With the intro of Rockstar Spud into 205, I'm interested to see if maybe they move uh, Mark Andrews over to 205 because... They were tag team partners back in Impact or TNA, yeah. whatever you want to call and it. And then Rockstar, so. of course, is from UK or whatever yeah. and stuff. So he has that connection, too. So maybe they'll be doing stuff with the UK guys more, maybe, as that's a possibility I'm for thinking, 205 Live. Because they're pretty much, besides Wolfgang, they're all under 205. That's that's the thing. WWE's grasping at straws right now, trying to help numbers on 205. It, I've suggested to you, Zio, why not do... A actual show of 205 with UK. Yeah. Send, send the 205 guys over to uh, the UK and have yeah. them tour and, and record actually that show record it. Yeah. And do kind of like they did the 
UK tournament and stuff like that. I guarantee more people would watch that because it's a mixture of you've got the what they call bruiserweight style yeah. and the more technical style with the 205, the which flyer. is a higher flyer. Yeah. And you might actually get better matches out of uh, Drew Gulak. Yeah. Especially against a guy like Wolfgang, who is kind of a heavyweight brawler where Gulak's more of the technical. You've, from the UK Championship, you saw great matches when they mixed a uh, technical versus a brawler. Yeah. Um, so then the last thing we have of the news is the New Japan New Beginning show. Of course, is their first big show after Wrestle Kingdom that took place earlier in the month. Um, so nothing really major. Like I know Tanahashi or yeah, Tanahashi, the, um, the guy that's like considered the John Cena of, uh, New Japan and stuff. He ended up losing the Intercontinental title to, um, uh, Suzuki, which I think that's fine and stuff. I mean, Suzuki's like an old guy, but he looks awesome and is really crazy. And I mean, when he goes out and has a match, depending on who he has a match with, you might get like a five star, just straight up fight. Yeah. Brawl, whatever you want to call and it. And yeah, and Suzuki's known as like an actual shoot fighter, so it does like MMA and stuff like that. So he can kick anyone's ass. Um, but so yeah, Tanahashi lost the title to him, which. Uh, makes sense because, you know, Tanahashi has a bunch of injuries and stuff, so they needed to get the title off him to let him go out and heal and stuff. And then, so the part that, um, I know uh, Okada has a match with Sonata from LIJ, but I have a feeling, you know, Okada's just going to retain the title. I doubt he's going to lose the heavyweight title to him. But the big news was that Jay White ended up winning the title off Kenny Omega, so Jay White is now the U.S. title holder, or... Switchblade Jay White as he's known now. Um, so that's kind of a news. I thought, you know, obviously if they were going to have someone win the U.S. title, it would be some U.S. guy. Um, which, I mean, Kenny's from Canada, but someone from the Americas. So, you know, I thought Chris Jericho possibly had a chance if he ever went back there. He's still Canadian. I know, but I meant so from the Americas at least. But I thought, but he lives in America, U.S. though and stuff now and has been here for years. But I thought maybe someone like him or if, because I know it's rumored that New Japan wants more WWE guys to come in. So either have some, you know, got WWE guy that's no longer with the company or some come in and win. Or have, you know, people already there, say like Juice or something like that. Just someone that would, they would maintain that. But Jay White won it, which I mean, he does, he's not Japanese. So I guess it, and anybody can win the title. But I just didn't think someone as new as Jay White would win the title though. But so Jay White ended up winning the title, which of course was a kind of a match to get back at um, Jay White turning down the offer into the Bullet Club by Kenny Omega. But then after um, later, I think it was later on in the show or something, we had a match, I think it was between Cody Rhodes and Kota Ibushi, I think it was. And I, I've, am I, do you know if that's right or not? Yeah. I would say, and then I believe Cody won or something. And then um, Cody and uh, what's his name? Hangman Page ended up attacking Kota Ibushi and beating him up and stuff, which caused Kenny Omega to come running out to help Ibushi because they're obviously friends from, uh, I think it's what, DDT Pro or something is the company? Uh, I'm not sure where I think that's part I think them. that's what it is. And so they're old friends from that and they've had stuff. And Kenny just said that he wants to have a match with Kota Ibushi and stuff at Wrestle Kingdom and everything because they're such good friends. They, you know, went from DDT, which is kind of like a joke company or something. It's kind of like the Harlem Go Globetrotters out of um, the wrestling business or whatever. Um, but they were partnered up there and became friends and now they've moved to New Japan, you know, the more serious and uh, more professional company, I guess you'd say. And so they want to be successful together in the company and stuff. So Kenny Omega came out to kind of get Bullet Club to back off of him, but that caused um, arguments between Kenny and Cody, which have had issues in the past, and caused a shoving match, I guess you call it, the, between them, of them pushing each other, and then Omega pushed one of the Young Bucks, I don't know which yeah, one. Yeah, I'm not sure which one it was. But one that was like kind of injured and stuff, he ended up pushing it, but of course then he like felt bad about doing it or whatever and stuff. But then they kind of made up or whatever because of that, you know, thinking everything's fine. But as Kenny started to leave, Cody attacked him again from behind, beating up. So we have the possibility of Kenny being kicked out of Bullet Club. And I would guess by that, that means Cody would be the new leader, like full-time leader of Bullet Club. Because I would say U US-wise, he's the 
leader yeah, of Bullet he's Club. the number one Bullet Club leader in the U.S. I'm kind of disappointed if that's how they're going to kind of split out of the Bullet Club. I'm kind of disappointed because New Japan never really... Uh, last year they had a thing going on with uh, Tama Tonga, which yeah, was yeah. one of the founding members of the Bullet Club, and Kenny Omega... And they never really did pull the trigger on that one, which would have been something nice to see because uh, the Gorillas of Destiny are one of my favorite tag teams, and I don't believe they get enough play over here in the states. Well, that's because they're signing the New Japan and stuff, but but I don't I don't know how much I believe this. I mean, I think it'd be cool because I think storyline wise, you could then have a lot of stuff. So you, of course, then afterwards they had the press conference of Omega and Ibushi, like. Coming back together, you know, Omega saying, you know, he's my friend and stuff and just going on about that, kind of reuniting them as a team or whatever. So I think it'd be cool to see tag matches with them, you know, against the Young Bucks or um, they just possibly would do a tag match with Hangman Page and Cody. Cody. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. And then, yeah, matches against Cody and stuff like that, just bringing a different dynamic between people. That, you know, we're in a group together like the Bullet Club, but then splitting them off and now facing each other and stuff to see who's the best and the better. In this case, who is the better leader type thing. But of course, then you could get breaking off of other members to each side or it could just be Kenny's out by himself, but obviously with Coda. But I think it'd be more interesting or this could just be a whole joke or whatever till another match comes up and like I was Kenny ends up turning on Coda and leads to their match at Wrestle Kingdom or something next year. Like I told you, I could also see this possibly playing out at uh, the Bullet Club show that they're trying to promote here in the U.S., I mean, what would be better for a main event than Cody versus Kenny? Yeah, I think that would be fine because I think if you did another match, well, then it's like, well, you've got to find another star then. Like, for either each of them to face and stuff where you can have two big names in the independent circuit that are both Wallet Club, which, you know, are the people behind this whole thing just facing off with each other. And I'm pretty sure it's a match people want to see because of kind of like the if he is kicked out the old leader get bullet club against the new leader bullet club and stuff well and if you follow uh i think the channel name's called being the elite on oh, youtube yeah. there's always kind of been that uh unease between cody and kenny yeah. so who knows like i said it could be just played up for that show they're trying to promote who knows but i think it's interesting and i uh, want to see where they go with it and like i said i think kenny should be separate but kind of with New Japan, though, you have, you like, your different factions and stuff, which I know Kota Ibushi is not in any faction, so that could be, like, them starting their own group or something, or just them two being, like, rogues in the company and stuff, which I um, don't know if they'll want to do that with Kenny, though, but I think it'll be interesting and I, uh, fun to see and stuff, but I think that's pretty much all the news for this week that's come out so far um, anything else that happens the rest of the week and of course next week you'll hear next week in our fast forward section of next week oh the last thing is um, announced this week for the WWE Hall of Fame that it's the Dudley Boys the Dudley Boys are going into the Hall of Fame and then I think the biggest nail in the coffin to Impact Wrestling was just announced a couple days ago with uh, Jeremy Borash oh, yeah. signing to WWE. I, I forgot to write that down. That, yeah, Jeremy Borash. Of course, he's currently a commentator on New or Impact, and he's re reported and rumored and even stated outright by Matt Hardy. He was pretty much the company person behind the whole... The Broken the, Hardy. Yeah, the Broken Hardy stuff. So, like, the filming on the compound and all that stuff. Stuff. He was the person from the company that was there working with Matt, and they were coming up with stuff together. So they're bringing that him in. So hopefully, I don't know what he's going to do, if he's going to be a backstage person, if he's going to be a commentator. So yeah, he goes all the way back to WCW. I think he said he was like 22 or 24 when he was on WCW. So he has a lineage in the comp and like the wrestling business and stuff, and I think he'll be a good addition no matter what he gets put into. Uh, but hopefully he'll be able... And help be able to help out with the Mount Hardy stuff and get that going on beyond what it is now and stuff. So that's interesting. So yeah, I forgot about the Dudleys and Vorash and stuff. And so I I obviously think the Dudleys are worthy going into the Hall of Fame. They're like one of the most decorated tag teams, probably compared next to the Road Warriors and stuff. So But like I said, I feel I'm happy for the Dudleys, but the bigger news there is Jeremy Borash to me because... Well, that has more effect on business. Well, yeah, but with Jeremy 
being one of the last surviving people from when TNA the founders started of out. TNA, yeah, because yeah. it was uh, the only other person that was there as of 2017 was James Storm and yeah, Abyss. Abyss. Yeah. And I, unless something happens, I don't see Abyss ever going to WWE. Uh, say by now, I would say he's probably too old. Yeah, and his. His his forte is the thumbtacks and the weird stuff. I think Joseph Park would be an interesting character because I love his Joseph Park character. <laughs> yeah, it'd be more of a comedy role, which yeah. they really don't have much of anymore. But yeah, I just I just feel this is probably the final nail in the coffin for Impact. I don't see. Well, them. I just think it's just a separation of the old TNA. A departure from old TNA into the new Impact. But that's version, the but thing. That's we won't know until the tapings, which on the night of this has the first airing of the tapings under the new management and full new company stuff. So it'll be interesting to see where they go from there. Unless they go back to what they had in 2003, which is kind of when they started to grow their company. Which, I mean, I just watched last night on Pluto TV, that's some of the best stuff that I've seen in wrestling other than Ring of Honor and New Japan, and so, I don't know, that's just my opinion. But I think that's going to be it for the Fast Forward segment this week. Don't forget to look at those links down in the description where you can follow us on social media, find the podcast on Apple Podcasts and SoundCloud, and you can watch the video on YouTube at Awesome Nerd Show, and don't forget to leave a subscribe while you're there. Uh, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week. Later! Later!